Hey, wasn't uh, really expecting to see you here. Actually, that is a lie because you are precisely the reason why I'm here. Not long ago, I did an article over on alternativephotography.com on my Welch method for the washing of uh, cyanotypes printed on Japanese washi paper, um, extremely fragile Japanese washi paper. And that drummed up a lot of interest in uh, how I do my regular cyanotypes. Got a lot of questions, and I, I don't mean that in the greasy YouTuber, social media bullshit kind of way I got questions just to do a video on it. I actually did get quite a bit of questions on how I make my cyanotypes. So, uh, seeing how my cyanotypes, at least generally, take anywhere from two to three days from beginning to end to complete, I thought I would pull an absolute alpha omega with you and take you with me on me making a cyanotype print from absolute beginning to end. I'm talking about, I'm going to dump out my chemicals that I've already made, make some new ones with you, and then, oh, don't worry about that. That's just my enlarger. That's Hunter. You may need to worry about him, but anyway, it's beside the point. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the chemicals you need. We're going to talk about the papers. Uh, nothing fancy. It's not going to be on Japanese washi paper. I'm going to be doing these on some cheap watercolor paper I picked up from Hobby Lobby. And you don't even need that technically. More or less, you can print a cyanotype on anything. I did them on paper towels. Uh, I did them on typing paper. Uh, you could do it on your hand if you wanted to, although I wouldn't really recommend it. All I have to say, folks, uh, this is something that I guarantee you, you can do at home. I'm going to show you everything that I do, unorthodox or not. And uh, case in point, uh, my cyanotypes uh, start the night before because I hate getting up early. So I'm going to move out of the dark room here because it probably sounds like I'm recording standing in a closet, which for good reason, because I'm, well, I'm standing in a closet. So I'm going to gather up our chemicals. Uh, you only need two. We're going to talk about these first in the mixing. Get these. Yeah. I hate making these measurable little life decisions. All right. I'm going to leave the apron on so you'll know I mean business. Oh, hello again, Miss Leia. You gonna sit here while I film? Yeah. Well, all right. I guarantee you she's gonna get upset with me for not paying her enough attention, but uh, onward. So, I follow John Herschel's oh original 1842 cyanotype process. That is technically only two chemicals and that is going to be potassium ferrocyanide and ferric ammonium citrate now i know these names seem kind of gnarly guys but believe it or not cyanotyping is one of if not the most earth-friendly non-toxic type of printing processes that you can do i probably wouldn't want to drink these so i mean i'll practice common sense but um, they're really probably not going to hurt you now, I'm going to uh, preface all this with the fact that you can get all this stuff pre-mixed. Um, I use Jack Hard. Uh, I'm not sponsored or affiliated with them, but uh, that's what I use. I like mixing my own chemicals for cyanotypes because I think, well, it might all be in my head, but I think I can add more of one, less of another, and control the result. But uh, anyway... All I have to say that if you don't want to mix your own chemicals, I will link to the pre-mixed cyanotype solution. You can get it from a few places. I get all this stuff from Amazon. But uh, so yeah, you can bypass all of this if you don't want to mix your chemicals. But um, of course, I'm going to mix them all myself. Before we actually get to the mixing on these two chemicals here, I want to go into a little bit more detail on how I mix my chemicals. Now, if you check the back, of both of these little drums you'll find some nifty instructions if you forget everything else if it comes down to it you can just work off the back of the jar 
Each one of these is made to concoct 400 milliliters of solution A and solution B. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. I generally just make up 100 milliliters, so a quarter of the recommended solution size. In the case of the potassium ferrous ionide, again, 400 milliliters, they call for 40 grams of the chemical. That means we're making 100, so that's a quarter of 400, so we're gonna use a quarter of 40, that's 10 grams. So for my process, 10 grams of potassium ferrous ionide mixed with 100 milliliters of distilled water, and that's gonna be important. Much the same for the ferric ammonium citrate. Calls for 400 milliliters of water. I use distilled water because, especially with this chemical here, there's virtually no way to avoid it. You will get some mold and fungus growing in that container if you store it for any amount of time. I've tried mixing alcohol with it. I've tried a few other things and it just simply grows mold. Uh, distilled water is your best bet. Um, even microwaving it, which we're gonna do here in a minute, that doesn't seem to help. So yeah, if you can, go with distilled water if you plan on storing either of your solutions. Now all that out of the way, 400 milliliters of the water distilled for the ferric ammonium citrate. They say add 100 grams, so we're gonna be quartering that again. So 25 grams for a 100 milliliter solution. We'll call that solution B of the ferric ammonium citrate. So now we're going to mix all this up. Isn't that fun? So I've drug out my Walter White scale here. I'm gonna show you how I do this. Now, if you can't tell folks, uh, with a lot of things I do, uh, Leah decided to take a five minute beverage break over here, but that's fine. With a lot of things I do, it's fairly cavalier, but with this, at least on mixing your solutions A and B, be as precise as you possibly can. That's why I use the scale. Everything after that, you can kind of have a little bit of wiggle room. So anyway, to get started, uh, turn my scale on. I use two measuring cups. I've already got 100 milliliters of water in this one. I'm going to zero that out. We're going to mix up solution A. That's the uh, potassium ferrocyanide. At least that's what I call it. I have heard you probably don't want to use a uh, metal utensil, a metal spoon or something. I've never done anything other than just shake it from the jar. So we're going to measure out about 10 grams. Get us to grams. There you go, grams. So 10 grams. I've heated the water a little bit. I found it helps with the mixing. Oh, oh, no. Here I'm talking about being precise. There's 11 grams. Well, let's see how that goes. So, that's solution A. I'm going to set it aside. And I'm going to bring in my second measuring cup with another 100 milliliters of heated distilled water. Now, if you don't have two vessels or you don't want to use two vessels, you can use one just to be absolutely certain you don't mix the two solutions. So really wash out your first uh, receptacle if you're not going to use two. The next one is going to be our ferric ammonium citrate. Uh, this is the light sensitive uh, of the two. Uh, it's UV light sensitive, so of course don't do it during the daylight or by a window or something like that and actually minimize the exposure of this to even regular tungsten light. So uh, generally kind of quick, we're going to take our tub, careful, try not to breathe it in, and we're going to go 12, shooting for 25. Four, and actually, since we went a gram over on our last one, I'm gonna try 
try to go to 26 grams here just to get the concentrations roughly the same. Voila! So here we have it. Our solution A and our solution B. I'm going to swirl these around, let them dissolve, and then pour them into our uh, little blue glass uh, dropper bottles, 100 milliliter dropper bottles. It's good to let these set, I think even the instructions on the jars say to let it set for 24 hours. Personally, folks, I've never done that. I have mixed and coated before many times, but with this, um, since it's gonna take me a minute to get everything else together, I'm gonna mix these up and then bottle them and then we're gonna let them set for an hour or so while I get everything else put together. So I'm gonna get these mixed up and bottled. I've got my bottles rinsed out. This is our solution A. You notice I'm using blue bottles. No particular reason. Uh, amber, blue would work. Actually, clear would work, but you want to be extra special careful with that. Regardless, try to keep these solutions in the dark and in the cool. Um, not so much of an issue with the potassium ferrocyanide, but the solution B, that ferric ammonium citrate, it is light sensitive. So, you know, take precautions there as you would with anything else that is light sensitive. Let's take our little top off. Let's implement a uh, paper towel here. Just be on the safe side. And pour this up. Give it one last little stir. And down the hatch. Now keep in mind that even though these are both 100 millimeter, uh, excuse me, 100 milliliter solutions. The ferric ammonium citrate, the solution B, has uh, about two and a half times more dissolved solids in that distilled water. So be careful if you have small containers like this that you don't overfill, thinking they're both 100 milliliters. So in goes our solution B. Just a gorgeous swampy green color. And like I said, really keep an eye on the level. I have overflowed these before. Getting close. Getting really close. All right. Happy day. That's a good sign. So you want to top this off. Oh, there it goes. Man, you are one pathetic loser. <laughs> oh, well. That's why we had the paper towel. So I'm going to let these sit. Uh, like I said, an hour or so. Get some other things together. Then we'll come back and coat our paper. It occurred to me while our uh, solutions are percolating over there, to talk just briefly about the kind of paper we're going to be using and uh, in our case today it's just hot press watercolor paper i think this is master's touch fine art studio like i said got it from hobby lobby hot press uh, a little fancy for me 30 uh, percent cotton acid free is actually sort of important, um, at least for archivability. We'll talk about that when we move into the, uh, the development. But uh, like I said, this is what we're gonna be using. It's 11 by 14, 300 GSM. Yeah, 300 GSM, 140 pounds. It uh, equals out, it's 12 sheets for about 18 bucks. So about $1.50 per sheet. And like I said, for me, that's still uh, kind of getting up there. So don't be afraid to use a different cheaper kind of paper as i said you can use virtually anything for this process you're going to want it to be at least somewhat thick um that's why i invented the welch method for washing washi paper that was for using papers and cyanotypes that are incredibly thin 
We're going to be tray developing these. So this is 300 GSM. More than likely want to stick to something 100 GSM or above, um, if not more than 100. Um, watercolor paper works best because it is that. It's watercolor paper. It's made more or less to get wet and reasonably stay together. So acid-free watercolor paper, you can get it on Amazon. You can buy it locally. Almost certain you can buy it locally like I do. I'll search around on Amazon if I find something similar. I'll post that down in the description. If you don't want to go to the store, I can understand that. All right, so, uh, yeah, it's been about an hour. Let's, yeah, let's coat up some paper. Now, before we coat the paper, let's have a quick and oh-so-exciting word on brushes. Uh, how are you going to coat the paper? Really, you don't even need a brush. I use these Japanese hockey brushes. Uh, I think I gave a total of... $15 for those off of eBay. And yeah, they're the good gold hair ones. So, yeah, they're not super high quality, but I love them. Anyway, um, you can use, especially if you're just starting out, I would use something like the little sponge brushes you can get at hobby shops or uh, like a regular supply store like uh, you know Home Depot or Walmart or Lowe's uh, that you use for applying stain. That works really well for this. You can use a dedicated paintbrush. Um, some people use rods. I don't really do that. But really anything to get the solution onto the paper is gonna work just fine. You don't have to go crazy with this kind of stuff. Don't overcomplicate it, is what I'm saying. Now with my brushes, like I said, I have three sizes. Uh, actually, I wash these thoroughly, but uh, still over time, the solution creeps up and it makes little cyanotypes on the brushes. And I absolutely love that. If I'm using a big sheet, like a full page emulsion, I'll use the big brush. So I'm gonna probably be doing a little window emulsion. I'm gonna use a little medium size here. And this little piggy doesn't get a lot of use. All right, so I have evacuated this back to the dark room simply because the solutions, even though they're not technically photosensitive or UV sensitive until you mix them, uh, LED bulbs actually sometimes give off a little bit of ultraviolet light. This is a tungsten bulb. I just like doing everything back here. It just makes me feel better. Uh, that's another reason why I like doing this at night because it uh, gives you a little bit extra cushion as far as avoiding UV light. So I'm going to tear out three sheets of our watercolor paper. And just to reiterate, this is 300 GSM hot press watercolor paper. If you're wondering, uh, if you see it in the store or online, the difference between hot press and cold press watercolor paper. Hot press is just as the name would suggest. It is uh, more or less pressed with a big iron, where cold press is just that. It's cold. And hot press paper generally has a smoother surface. If you want to impress your friends and be fancy, it's called the tooth the roughness or texture of the surface. So a smooth tooth is generally hot press. If it's rougher, it's probably cold press. Your solution will dry faster on a hot press than a cold press. You actually have a rough press paper, a um, little bit more rare, but you can find it. But anyway, just like uh, with photographic prints, some cyanotypes will look better with a smoother surface. Some will look better with a more textured surface. You'll have to be the judge of that. But uh, just for hours, we're gonna be using a hot press. That's what I have. So I'm gonna set this aside. And before we get going here, guys, uh, just so you know, this will really stain things. So keep your work area uh, protected. You can see here, all the little nasties going on. Now, if you do get it on your clothes, that's why I wear the apron, but if you get it on your clothes or anything you don't want it on, you can wash it off immediately with water. If it gets to the blue stage like this, use some sodium carbonate or washing soda, and that will bleach that right out, no problem. So to mix up our cyanotype emulsion, I have wet the hockey brush uh, with just some regular tap water. These are, like I said, not just stupendously qualitative brushes, and this goes for any brush. It's kind of run out with your fingers to pull out any stray hairs before you actually paint your emulsion on. That's gonna go a long way to eliminating any brush bristles getting stuck on your paper. Put you there. Get our solution A. 
And if you thought the actual mixing of the solution was easy, guys, this is going to be an absolute piece of cake. Make sure it's good and mixed. You're going to go 50-50 with solution A and solution B. So half and half. With these pages, this is three. I'm going to go about like that. Just kind of eyeballing it. I'm going to go with 30 drops each really technical so there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two three four five six seven eight nine ten oh one two three four five six seven eight nine ten again solution a that is our potassium ferrous ionide. Now we go with solution B, our ferric ammonium citrate. Again, 30 drops. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And you guessed it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is our cyanotype emulsion, and that's all there is to it. I always like to mix up less than I think I might need because you can always make more. I just don't like to waste it. There's been some situations to where I mixed up way too much and didn't have anything to do with it. Okay, that's pretty good. Grab our platform, which is today. 11 by 14 development tray first page and like I said guys you can go full page with your emulsion you can go little bitty tiny areas it depends on your negative depends on your picture whatever you're making um, I'm gonna go a little bit smaller than the negative I'm gonna use most of my negatives are about 8 by 10 ish so just put your brush down in the solution get it saturated you don't want too much. And believe it or not, for all my freewheeling ways, the coating of your paper is actually fairly important. You want to pick a direction, make your strokes in that direction. And then you're going to do it four ways. So there's one, you want to go this way, no particular order, up and down. And the reason for this, you hear some people, they double coat their paper. This eliminates the need for that. I never double coat. The reason is, Every time you make a stroke, that's going in a direction on the paper. So when you go this way, that gets that side of the paper. You go this way, that gets that side, up and down, gets both sides there. You would be shocked how much a good coat of your paper will go towards getting a more dense cyanotype. So take extra special care when you're covering your paper with the emulsion. I guarantee you, a little time here will make a much more solid cyanotype. So there's one. Pat yourself on the back. Lay that aside. We'll lay these flat to dry. Sometimes I hang them up. Uh, the papers that are very fragile, generally I will hang them up. So be careful because sometimes your emulsion can run and pull. Experience is the best teacher. So let's go a little bit smaller this time, maybe a little bit more rustic. I used to, and still do at times, call myself a bit of a militant cyanotypist, because I used to literally just sling the emulsion onto the paper. Actually, let's, let's do that now. Why not? So that one's done. One more to go. Let's 
switch these out. Let's go with something relatively small. Just right in the center of this one. Add a little design to it. Like Mr. Ross says, doesn't matter. Doesn't even matter. Oftentimes the more arcane designs turn out to be my favorite. That's one of the things I love about cyanotypes. What we're doing now is a fingerprint onto the paper. Couldn't do this again in a million years. Absolutely love it. All right, there's three sheets coated. A little bit left, but that's okay. So I'm gonna rinse off the brush. We're gonna let these dry until tomorrow. Then we're gonna really make some cyanotypes. Hakuna Matata. Would you look at that? The sun is shining. The birds are singing. The rain, not there. So that means today is print day. We're going to finally make our cyanotypes. And I want to show you how I frame these up for exposure to the sun. Now you may be wondering, Adam, I've probably seen some videos uh, on YouTube, read some stuff. Why don't you just use a UV light or UV light bulb? There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. I don't do that. I've said before, I love these kind of processes. And for me, the UV light from the sun is just part of the process that I enjoy. So you can use UV lights. You can get them virtually anywhere. So you can make your cyanotypes at virtually any time. That's just not my bag. So now that we have this beautiful cloudless day after that tempest yesterday, let's really get going. Now, first things first, when it comes to printing the cyanotype, all cyanotypes, more or less, there are a few exceptions, are what are called contact prints. That means that the paper with the emulsion will make contact with your negative or the object that you're making your cyanotype from. Sun or the UV light comes in, hits the negative in our case, goes through, hits the paper, essentially casts a shadow. Now there is something called penumbra. It's a Latin word, umbra, shadow, pen, almost. Penumbra is the outside edges of a shadow. And the closer you can get your negative or your object to the paper, the sharper the shadow, the sharper your cyanotype. That's where printing frames come in. And here's mine. Now here you saying over there, Adam, that looks just like a regular picture frame. Well, that's because it is a regular picture frame. The day I decided to start making cyanotypes, of course I didn't have a contact printing frame. I looked around the house, usually have some old frames laying around. And that's what this is. It consists of four sets of two screws. I butchered up, uh, piece of a window blind here. They're flexible. They go on the screws. In between them are some little blocks of wood. They act as tensioners and that presses the foam backing of the frame up against the paper and the glass and it makes for a brilliant, brilliant contact frame. Now, you can get dedicated contact printing frames, of course, um, that are extremely high quality. They're also a little pricey for what they are. So if you're just getting into cyanotypes, you want to do it, I guarantee you can do it today. You can find a contact printing frame today, go to the store, get the cheapest picture frame that you can find that is big enough for your paper and it's ready-made. 
that's what a picture frame does. It holds a picture very flat. That's what you need for making cyanotypes. So I urge you that if you don't want to go the um, mainstream contact printing frame route, uh, get you just a regular pencil frame, uh, picture frame, and you'll be good to go. Now, I'll say this too, you don't even actually need the frame. However, if you are using negatives for your cyanotypes, you will want some way to push that down as flat as possible. You can just lay the negative on there, but usually it'll bow just a little bit. It'll be a little blurry. Uh, just get a piece of glass. You can even use a piece of plexiglass and just lay it on a flat surface over the negative in the paper. Put that under the sun, and generally that'll work just fine. So let's take my janky printing frame here. I've always said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm gonna show you. Gonna load up the paper, gonna load up our negative, and get a little solar power going and make our print. Naturally, we're back in the dark room, of course, it's just daylight you know, to avoid that UV light. And we're gonna load up our negative and our paper into a contact frame. So we have our paper. Give it a little blow off here. And this is wholly subjective, folks. This is the uh, little Bob Ross one that we made uh, not before last now. And this is our negative. I actually had an eight by 10 negative uh, shot on Winston yesterday that I almost used. That's a true uh, film negative, but I wanted to use one I printed before. Uh, so hopefully anyway, it'll be less chance of me uh, mucking it up. And I'll say this too, folks. I've made a lot of cyanotypes, uh, muy muy cyanotypes. And uh, I still mess them up. Uh, fairly regularly, so don't worry about if you mess this up. It's uh, something that's just going to happen regardless, so uh, just go with the flow. We continue. This is a digital negative. You'll notice it's orange. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly here later. That could be an entire video unto itself. But just like a regular film negative, it has a front and a back, an emulsion side and a base side. You want to put the emulsion side on your paper. This is a big reason why you want to allow your emulsion to dry as thoroughly as possible. Because when you set this into the sun, it will evaporate off that emulsion if it's not totally dry and that can completely ruin your negative. So be sure that your emulsion of your paper is bone dry. I think, I think I like that. This was years ago down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Swam out way too far, which is fine. If you haven't done it before, digital negatives will absolutely change your life. Regular painter's tape, I keep that on the side of the frame here. This helps to keep the negative in place when we flip the paper. Put that there. Bit one last little dust. Take out that black card. Static free brush. Make sure you don't leave any bristles off your brush. That has ruined more than one of my prints. Now we will flip the negative. Start at the untaped end, hold down, and sometimes if you're lucky, the tape will just self-detach. Not so today. So we'll remove the tape from the negative, holding pressure to keep everything in place. This can be the tricky part, especially if you're using a smaller negative. And that is keeping everything static while you replace this stuff. Easy, easy. Very good. On goes our foam backing. Foam backing, that is. Pressure. We have our tensioning boards, as high-tech as they are. 
And once you get one in place, I don't want to say you're home free. Don't count your chickens before they hatch, you know. But generally, that's going to keep that negative and the paper in place. And there we go. All loaded up. We'll keep our fingers crossed that when we flip this, everything is still marginally in place. Brilliant. Every now and then, I will use some regular Windex to uh, clean the entire glass front and back because over dozens and dozens of prints, it will get just a little bit dirty. And as clean as possible is what you need because uh, we will likely spot this like a regular darkroom silver gelatin print. Very easy to do, but the cleaner you have it, the less chance you're going to have little particles on there, and that's going to leave little spots on your print. So the more care you take here, the less work you're going to have to do later in spotting. So let's get this into the sun. So. While our print is cooking here, let's talk about exposure and the sun. As you can see, it is a uh, tremendously bright sunny day out here. It's actually kind of chilly. It's about 36 degrees Fahrenheit now. That's what, two or three degrees Celsius. But like I said, it feels pretty good in the sun. How about you? You feel pretty good? Now, no longer than I've had this print out here, I can already see that emulsion starting to darken beneath the negative here. And your exposure is going to depend mainly on two things. One, the density, the darkness of your negative, and the brightness of the sun. This negative is not extraordinarily dense, but the sun is incredibly bright. Um, making cyanotypes are, is, you can make it as complicated or as simple as you want, it's like fly fishing or cooking. Uh, depends on how far you want to go with it. You can make exposure charts, do test strips, that kind of thing. Generally, I just go by feel. And uh, this is where having a dedicated contact frame might come in handy because most of them you can lift up one side, check your print, and keep a very dynamic view of the process itself. But we're just going to go by feel, which is my favorite thing to do. I'm thinking at least five minutes on this. Um, it just depends. Generally, if you want to keep a visual track of the exposure, the cyanotype emulsion starts out as that kind of brackish yellow. And when it's done, it turns uh, sort of a silvery pale blue color. I've heard kind of a bronze color. Generally, my, um, my take is when it gets very gray blue, if that makes any sense. You'll know it when you see it. But generally, it's better to overexpose your cyanotype prints rather than underexpose because you actually can dial that back some with some bleaching. And we'll talk about that uh, if I decide to do a bleaching and toning episode. But uh, like I said, that can get kind of, kind of involved. And we don't need to do that now. So yeah, I don't know. We've got at least three more minutes. I'll come back out here and check on this. And then, uh, yeah, we'll actually develop it. In the meantime, I'm gonna head back in. I mentioned the negative, why it's orange. Let's talk a little bit about printing digital negatives and what I use to print mine. So let's go in. You be good. I think I've mentioned folks, uh, I'm in the process of getting my house ready to go on the market. So. It's like a tornado came through here. But this is our printer, Pixma TR422, excuse me, TR4522 from Canon. Dirt cheap printer and scanner combination, but it happens to be a very good dirt cheap printer and scanner combination. Believe it or not, I got this because my last printer, uh, the cartridges were so expensive, it was cheaper for me to buy a brand new printer and be done with it. So this is, of course, a little standard. Oh, we have a negative in there. Pretend you didn't see that because I honestly forgot it. The digital negatives that I make are on these little, they're actually clear 
when you print them. But these little pieces of acetate transparency is very cost effective. I think I got maybe a hundred of them for 20 bucks, something like that. So you completely process your digital image uh, in Lightroom, Photoshop, whatever you want to use. Print that over to that transparency. It comes out the inkjet and you have a digital negative. Now I use, uh, again, you saw that I have the orange negative because I read way back when I first started printing cyanotypes that a darker orange color negative actually produces a little bit better contrast for your negative overall. And I've never went back. Uh, they work fine for me. That's at least I, that's how I use it. So that's why my negatives are orange in case you're wondering. Now, of course, actually speaking of that negative that was on the scanner here, this is a uh, real film eight by 10 inch negative that uh, actually shot with Winston. And when you use those, you don't have as much control over how they are exposed after they are developed. So that is something that you can definitely start off with if you have a larger negative, it doesn't even need to be larger, but a negative that you want to use to make a cyanotype that is from a film camera, definitely use that. Personally, I prefer that from an aesthetic standpoint. How pretentious is that? It just gives a depth to it that um, sometimes I don't feel like I'm getting from my digital negatives, but the sheer ease and accessibility and versatility of using a digital negative, virtually being able to turn any digital photograph you have into a cyanotype or a silver gelatin contact print for that matter is extraordinary. And I absolutely love it. Uh, again, much like the bleaching and toning, that could be its, its whole episode. So we'll see how that goes. Now, while I've been talking here, we're coming up on five minutes on the print. So let's go check that out. Oh yeah, coming along very nicely. If this was, maybe you can see a little bit better. If this was a full sheet emulsion and it was bigger than the negative, you could really see how that's coming along. I can see in the transparent parts, you're making a very, very close to that grayish silver blue color. I'm gonna let this go Let's call it another minute. And I'm gonna stay out here with it. And then we'll take him in. Of course I have company out here, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Spoiled noodle, yeah. All right. Oh, 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 you're already back. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we got to go in here in a minute. Okay. Anyway. We're getting very close now. Tail. I'm going to let that go a little bit more than a minute. One of the reasons is, I don't know if you can see it here, there's a little seagull right up there. And I'm afraid if I don't let that expose a little bit more, that might not pick up on the finished print. Okay, 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 are you ready? Are you saying it's done? Okay, we'll go in. All right, I guess that's a good sign. Now that our print is exposed and brought in out of the UV light, I want to show you the wash setup before we actually crack open the nut of the contact frame. Now, we are in my guest bathroom, which over the years has turned into somewhat of a uh, large format wash tub. Much like the exposure time of your sandal type, the wash time and indeed the wash process itself will depend on the type of paper you're using. And in our case, we're using that 300 GSM heavy watercolor paper, so I'm be doing this in the trays. And if this was a thinner paper, we'll be using the Welch method. But this is the 
bare bones, most simplistic way to develop and wash your sound types. Now our first bath is going to be a mixture of regular tap water and acetic acid in the form of regular distilled white vinegar. This can be somewhat uh, counterintuitive because you know at the beginning we were talking about how you should use uh, acid-free paper for the archivability quality. So why would we be acidifying the paper? Well, two reasons. One, my tap water is extremely alkaline. And two, the more acidic your bath, at least your first bath, the deeper the blue, the more contrast you're gonna have right out of the gate before you do anything else. So I like to acidify my first bath. Come on, vinegar. With just a little bit of vinegar, nothing technical. If you want to get really down to it, I would say this is maybe, maybe one to 100 ratio. Of course, it's always better, if you can, to use distilled water. It just eliminates a lot of variables, um, but you're running into a lot of water if you go that way, especially the storage of the water. So, I just use plain old tap water. Now that we have our first two baths prepared, let's crack open that print. So off comes the tensioners. Out comes the foam and the backing. Here we have our latent image on the paper. That's what it looks like before we develop. I can tell this may end up being just a little bit light once it's developed. I don't know. We're about to find out. So in we go to our first water bath. Again, this is the acidified bath with vinegar. And this one shouldn't have too much emulsion to actually wash off since it's just a small window here. But what's happening is the emulsion that we applied to the paper is being oxidized by the water. And you're starting to get that blue coming in nicely. Oh, I don't think it's underexposed at all. Starting to see that little gull <laughs> poking up there. So good agitation is key. You're gonna want to, one, wash to develop the emulsion, and secondly, to get rid of all of the unexposed emulsion, which on this one, it's not gonna be too much. Good wash is key to our capability because uh, it will yellow if you leave the emulsion on there because a lot of the emulsion is yellow. Brilliant. I think this will only need maybe one other bath. I've already got that prepared here, which is not acidified. So yeah, let's uh, switch out trays. Carefully take the paper out. Although this is a sturdy, sturdy stock. In with the paper and we'll just agitate again. I'll mention, get back in there, that I said I use tap water, which is true, but with my final bath, after everything is said and done, I try to use distilled water because that just helps bring the acidity back to more or less towards the basic side and helps with the archival life. All right, I actually ended up going with a third bath just to be on the safe side, be sure it's absolutely clean, fully developed. And this is what the more or less raw cyanotype print appears after it's done with the initial bath. Something that's fairly important that I forgot to add, use cold water for your baths no matter what you're doing because heat, I've learned the hard way, will fade the cyanotype. So the colder the better, generally. And I think, yeah, we're ready for the next step here. And that is going to be darkening up this blue with a 2% solution of hydrogen peroxide and distilled water. For me, 
This is the most magical portion of the entire process. I absolutely love it. Never get tired of it. It's sort of like seeing your prints develop in the dark room. Uh, now think about it, uh, since I'm filming side unseen and this will not have a second shot, let me be sure I'm actually recording on the GoPro. I'm recording, but I've disembarked it uh, from the old cabeza here, uh, so you can see a little bit better. So in goes the peroxide bath. Isn't that magic? You saw that darken up on contact. What this is actually doing is accelerating the oxidation process that would take place naturally over the next few days. And it just gives you a great idea of how the print will finally look. Absolutely brilliant. Hello, Seagull. Now this solution, you can reuse it a few times. This is fresh, so I'm going to free up a hand and pour it back into the bottle to use later. So we're gonna give a final bath, which is some plain distilled water. Something I like to do, as I said, gives me peace of mind, thinking that with the distilled water, it sort of finishes the print, removes as much acid as possible, kind of, as I said, balances out that pH for maximum archivability. Which, I mean, cyanotypes last for at least 100 years, uh, probably not longer. It's one of the most archival print processes around. So who knows how long this print will actually last. Okay, drain out the water. Uh, I never grow tired of it. So as it stands now, this paper is extremely wet and the emulsion is extraordinarily delicate. It will smudge. I use a piece of plexiglass for a drying board, but you can hang these. I like to dry them flat. Uh, makes for a lot flatter print in the end. So I've wet the plexiglass and just bloop, it will adhere to the surface, kind of roll it on. Be very careful. Of course, you can always trim off the edges later, but uh, be as delicate as possible. And something I am asked uh, whether or not I use a roller on these, you can. Um, you can lay paper towel or clean cloth over it, use a brayer roller or something similar, roll it out. It helps the drying time expedite. However, you can introduce a lot of little nasties to the surface of the print. So with this thicker paper, I generally don't do that. Now with my thinner papers, like my delicate washi, sometimes I will do that just to help flatten it out, remove some bubbles, but uh, we're just gonna let this one dry flat on the plexi. So uh, naturally, the thicker the paper, the longer the drying time. That is a relatively uh, heavy paper stock, so we're gonna let that go until tomorrow. It's always a good idea, uh, especially if you're gonna be doing any kind of toning, to let the paper completely dry before you, uh, what like I said, tone or spot, because you wanna have a good idea of that final density of the blue. A lot of people say that it will darken up uh, as it dries. I've actually found mine lighten. Uh, I don't know if that's because when they say it darkens up, that's the oxidation process that we've already sped up with the hydrogen peroxide. I don't know. All I have to say, I let my prints completely dry, um, at least overnight, before I do anything else to them. Uh, so we're gonna pick this up tomorrow, uh, probably with some spotting. I don't think I'm going to tone that. I know I'm definitely not going to uh, do any toning in this video, but like I said, it's probably very likely we'll do some mild touch-ups on that after it dries, depending on if there's any dust in there. Probably gonna be some dust in there, but we'll see. Yeah, day four, here we come. Welcome back, friends. Today is spotting day for our friend here, and I'm very pleased 
to say that there's really not a whole lot to do at all to this saddle type. Very, very clean. There is one, maybe, possibly two little spots on here where some dust made it onto the glass. Overall, uh, like I said, it's a good cyanotype, type, at least from a technical standpoint. So what I use to spot, uh, if you're not familiar with spotting, it's a, uh, you hear a lot about it in traditional dark room printing and silver gelatin printing. You just take uh, ink, or in our case, it's gonna be uh, a water soluble ink, and you literally spot. Um, sometimes with a brush, I found that a toothpick works the best for me and my sandal types. But you just go in and fill in those little white spots and spotting to where the light didn't get transferred onto the print for whatever reason or another. It could be dust or lint or something on the um, in between the negative and the paper. Now, what do I use to spot my sandal types beside the toothpick? I use this uh, Parker Pen Quink. This is blue black. I love fountain pens. This is what I use in my fountain pen. And through some weird fortune of the universe, this works absolutely perfectly for my cyanotypes, at least the general formula that I use. It uh, matches perfectly in tone. I dilute it out with some water to make it uh, lighter or more concentrated as I need it. And works absolutely beautifully. So I'm going to uh, move some things around, try to show you this little spot uh, that I'm going to spot. Isn't that funny? And I uh, get rid of that. And believe it or not, four days later, we're going to be all done. There's likely no way for you to see this on the GoPro, but I've laid my spotting toothpick with this end pointing directly to that little white spot. And that's what we are going to spot. Like I said, not a lot to do at all. The spot that I see is right up top here. Gently, gently, gently when you do this. Less is always more. You can always put more on. A lot easier than you can take take some out so go lighter in the beginning and build up the spot brilliant I see one more tiny little minute portion here I'm gonna hit that just a little bit to be thorough Beautiful. All right. Um, now I should have mentioned before I were to uh, tone this, which I'm not going to tone this print, but if I was going to tone it uh, with my tea bath, I would have done that after I had dried it, but before I would have spotted it. Because like I said, this ink that I'm using is water soluble. If I would have spotted it, put it on there, it would just wash right off. And, um, when you tone, of course, then you know when you're toning, you're going to bleach too. So that's going to uh, throw into um, play some variables with the blues, the colors of this. So it's always good to have your uh, print completely finished how you want it before you do any spotting at all. All right, so uh, that print is a wrap. And uh, since we're done, I'm going to go back and recap some of the things. I know there's probably a few things I forgot to mention along the way. So let's cover that and we'll be done.
all right. So four days later, uh, granted we had to take that zero day a few uh, few days ago because of the storm. Uh, four days we have a cyanotype. Keep in mind, it's not going to take you four days to make one cyanotype. I am a habitual non-rusher. So I'll take my time with all this. I just made the one for the sake of our friendship here. Uh, generally, if you have a nice run of sunny weather and have everything prepared, a little bit of practice, you can make anywhere, probably 10, 20 cyanotypes if you want to, or more if you're using a dedicated UV lamp. That brings up another point. You can just have set days to do each task. You have a delegated coat day, like we did, or coat night, like we did, a print day, a uh, develop day, a toning day, spot day, and like I said, you can actually make a lot of cyanotypes if you really want to do it that way. Now, I want to sum up all the points that we covered here. I know there's got to be some things that I forgot to mention along the way. First off, the chemicals that you need. Remember, you only need two. One, two. John Herschel's original 1842 recipe. That's all you need aside from some water. Potassium, ferricidinide. I have an accent, if you haven't noticed, and I've picked up throughout the video. I got the talking fast, and sometimes it sounds like I'm saying ferrocyanide. It's just how I sound. There is a big difference. You want the ferricyanide with the I, not the O. Potassium, ferricyanide and ferric ammonium citrate. Like I said, I use Jacquard, not sponsored or anything. It's just what I use. I will link to that. I will also link to the stuff uh, pre-mixed if you don't want to go through the trouble of mixing your own cyanotype emulsion. For paper, like I said, folks, you can literally use anything. I will, if you want to be a dirty copycat, I will link to absolutely everything that you've seen here if you want to just go through the numbers and get everything that you know you've seen. But go to your local store, try it on typing paper to begin with if you want to. Try it on something extremely cheap before you jump into the deep end of the pool. It'll print on anything, virtually anything, believe me. I use the 300 GSM watercolor paper here. I got that from Hobby Lobby. Any kind of watercolor paper would be fantastic, but like I said, it doesn't have to be anything outlandish. There's something that will hold the emulsion and something that you can wash. Now, as far as applying the emulsion, you saw me use these hockey brushes. You can use literally anything, or that is at least anything that will take the emulsion and spread it evenly across the paper. Now I mentioned in the video, the little sponge brushes. This is what I was talking about here. These are stain brushes. I think these things go for like 25 cents, something like that, so a little of nothing. And if you don't want to use something like that, if you don't want to use the uh, hockey brushes, just a traditional paint brush will work perfectly fine. I do recommend if you go that route, only use that brush for your cyanotype. So don't actually be doing any painting with your brush and then try to do cyanotypes before or after. Remember, when you're covering your paper or whatever you're going to be putting your emulsion onto to print your cyanotype, make sure you get good coverage. Go in the four directions, north, south, east, west. Go one way, go the other way, go one way, go the other way. That makes sure that all the particles of the paper are coated fairly evenly, and that's really going to help you with the density of your finished print. Exposure to the sun, of course, the sun is what you need. The contact printing frame, again, you saw mine, doesn't have to be anything just crazy. Something that will hold the print, uh, excuse me, the negative and the paper steel and let the sun pass through it. That's really all you need. I highly recommend just some sort of cheap picture frame, especially if you're going small to begin with, with your paper. That's really all you need to get this done. Now, when it comes to exposing your cyanotype, again, some type of UV light is all you need. It is a good idea to print generally in midday. It makes it less complicated. You know, noon, the sun is coming straight down, so you can just lay your print flat and it'll be fine because there is some, um, and there's a lot of uh, contestation, well, not a lot of contestation, but a lot of people make a big deal out of it. Let me put it that way about tilting your print where it's perpendicular to the sun. So the sun rays are going on it as straight as possible. I somewhat partially subscribe to that. I do it when I can. So just remember, uh, when you expose your sound types out in the sun or in a UV light, just make sure wherever the light source is, is hitting that as dead on 
as possible. Something that I know I didn't mention when we were loading up the negatives and the paper was why I have that black backing, that black poster board in my frame. Well, the reason for that is I do a lot of really thin paper printing. Like I said, I've mentioned uh, my affinity for uh, Japanese washi paper and cyanotypes. The sun will actually shine through the paper. And if it hits that white um, foam board on the back, it will bounce back and make a lot of what's called scatter. And that can degrade the sharpness and the contrast of your print just because you have sunlight bouncing back and it can expose the backside of it. It can make some weird effects. Um, it's hard to explain. But when I put that uh, black matte board back there, that essentially helps absorb some of that light, keeps it from bouncing back, uh, virtually none, but it keeps it from bouncing back and it just eliminates again some variables in the printing process. That being said, we are hypothetically in winter here in West Tennessee, so the temperatures are actually fairly chilly. However, if you're printing these in the summertime or in a climate that's really hot, be careful because the sun can actually melt your negatives, uh, especially if you have a black backing the way I do printing in a black frame. You will see me when I print in the summertime, I actually clip a little USB battery powered fan to the frame to blow air onto the front of the uh, contact printing frame to help keep that cool. Generally, it's not a big deal since uh, in the summertime it's really bright sun, so you're not exposing for you know 20 minutes at a time. However, really dense negatives uh, that would require that much exposure, even bright sun, really keep an eye on your negative when it's hot or just in general to be sure you're not ruining uh, the irreplaceable thing that you have for printing your cyanotypes. Development, I'm a big fan of an acidified first bath. You saw me use the vinegar. I think it helps with the contrast. Again, this is gonna depend, uh, depend on your uh, the cyanotype that you're printing. If it's a really high contrast cyanotype, you might wanna forego the vinegar on that first bath to help lower the contrast. I personally always use a hydrogen peroxide um, second to last bath to oxidize that. Brings out a really, really deep blue that I personally like, that really deep Prussian blue. Uh, again, you don't have to do that, but uh, I find it does help and peroxide is exceedingly cheap. If you choose to spot your prints, you don't have to. Uh, do that the last thing, even after you do any kind of toning. I know we really haven't gone into toning, but if you, there's a lot of resources out there. If you choose to tone your prints after you've watched this, even though I hadn't covered it, be sure you do that before you spot, if you spot at all because uh, most of these spotting materials, like my ink, is water soluble, and that's gonna wash right off when you rinse off your toning. And as far as incidentals go, definitely want some sort of storage bottles for your solutions A and B. They last a long time when they're mixed up. That is the separate solutions, the A and B solutions. After you mix them, and uh, technically they become the light sensitive, the uh, photosensitive emulsion, Supposedly they don't last, it doesn't last very long at all. I will be completely honest with you folks because of course I am. I have coated paper and then for one reason or another, you know, life happens. And I have used paper that I have coated weeks after the fact. It starts to look a little funky. It can turn a little um, like greenish, brackish. Uh, even if your paper is completely 100% acid free, uh, just age, it will oxidize a little bit. Of course, that's not ideal. Always use your emulsion as soon as it dries thoroughly on your paper. But if you wanted to, just give it a try because I could really see not a lot of difference in my cyanotypes that had been kind of roosted up on that paper for a few weeks and those that were extremely fresh emulsions. For this kind of work, I also recommend some type of rum drink. Uh, I'm personally a mojito man myself. Anything strong, anything light, I uh, found is ideal for printing cyanotypes. And I mentioned a few times during the video, if you want to segue into printing on some more um, fragile papers, do check out that video on the Welch method for washing cyanotypes printed on Japanese washi. I think I've linked to it somewhere in the video. I'll put it down in the description too. There's a full text article uh, with a lot of pictures over on alternativephotography.com that I did um, sort of as an accompaniment, accompaniment for that video as well. Is there anything else? Oh yeah, one more thing, uh, kind of going back to the spotting. This is just my fountain pen ink 
This is just what I use. Uh, again, it's that Parker pen, quink, it's blue black. For me, if you follow everything that I've done here, reproduce it to a T, that matches perfect. So I guess I'll link to that too if you wanna do your own spotting. Uh, go about finding your own toothpicks. I'm not gonna link to anything like that, my God. Well, folks, I have to say, it's been an absolute pleasure doing this. I've been meaning to do it for a while now, so I'm glad I've finally got it out of the way. Well, not out of the way. Like I said, it was kind of a cool thing to do. I know it's got lengthy, uh, so I'm not gonna ramble on forever. If you have any questions, though, about this, uh, anything that you've seen, of course, you know where to put them down in the comments. I've actually just moved my website over to Squarespace. So that is there. The link's down in the description if you want to use the contact form and ask uh, anything about it. Um, I'm gradually putting, of course, everything's for sale because I'm a bit of a whore. I'm gradually putting the cyanotypes uh, for sale there. This one will actually be on the website too if you want to take a look at it. But um, reach out to me there. Of course, all the usual places. I'm um, on Instagram all the time. So you can hit me up there at Adam Welch Photographers if you really want to talk. And uh, you can follow along with some of the uh, more updated stuff I do with cyanotypes. I mentioned alternativephotography.com. I'll probably be doing an update on the Welch method. I've been experimenting with some toning and incorporating that into uh, that very specific wash method that I've developed. So that's always fun to keep track of. So yeah, I said I was going to shut up, so I'm going to do that now. Thanks a lot, everybody, sincerely, for joining me here. I hope you try this yourself. It is a thoroughly enjoyable photographic printing process that I really love, and I think you will too. So until next time, Muito.